So we're at about four minutes after the hour. Let's let's get started here. So Jesse Dittmar, New York. So you are a New York City based photographer. When I when I think about you, and I'm on your email list, by the way, and I would suggest everyone here get on your, get on his email list. You send emails, and every time I get one of your emails, it's a face that I recognize. It's a celebrity. It's someone of note, either politically or in the entertainment industry or something. And when I've interviewed you, you you are the consummate photographer. You're running around New York City. You got a skeleton crew with you, and you're going into people's homes in some cases like you were inside Roger Stone's home taking photos of him and all these different celebrities no political affiliation obviously but you're in there doing the job and coming out with great photos before we dive into this nft stuff just give us the the origin story of Jesse Dittmar and w why you became a photographer and where you are now oh uh, thanks Frederick I I'm you know I uh I've always wanted to do it, to be honest, since I was 16, 17. I, I remember sitting in uh, in Barnes and Noble talking about uh, talk about old school ways to look at photography compared to what we're gonna be speaking about later and sitting on the, the dingy floor and sifting through Annie Leibovitz books and Avedon books and Irving Penn books and, and just being totally amazed by this unbelievable artistic medium on top of just wondering how how is this how is this done? How do we make this happen? So ever since then, I've been on a kind of pretty straight path to where I am now. I ended up working for those people, working for Annie Leibovitz, assisting for seven years, and then going out on my own and shooting on my own, um, bre breaking out and working a lot with the New York Times and the Washington Post. And I've been publishing all of these magazines and publications that have been a total dream of mine. And I photographed so many people that I've wanted to photograph. It's it's just really exciting and you know every every day every week is somebody new and somebody different and something something that's really exciting that I, you couldn't possibly know beforehand that you, you'd be having these experiences it's uh it's really exciting i love the medium i love the job and and i'm excited about where it's going with with nfts in particular I love that. You, you and I, we've had, like I said before, we've had some really interesting conversations on different tangents, like just like real stuff as it applies to to being a working photographer and some of the issues that you face, you know, from assistance all the way down to just the, the gig, right? Yeah. So yeah, I encourage folks to go check that out. And you and I will continue discussing this, you know, into the future in different in different programs. But let's totally. dive into it. Let's dive into NFT and, and blockchain. Let's just let's lay a foundation for what we're talking about. Um, and I, you know, normally what I would do at this point is attempt to describe the thing and then ask questions about it. I'm not going there because I, I have a Swiss cheese level of knowledge sure. when it comes when it comes to blockchain. Can you help us understand that? Like help us before we get into the, NF, the NFT kind of offshoot what is this cryptocurrency stuff and what is what is the blockchain yeah totally the block the blockchain is is a public ledger it's it's a bunch of computers that have a public ledger a list basically and they're recording transactions they're recording who owns what and not just one place has it many many places have it so mm -hmm. you know if uh now let me let me pause here for a second anyone explaining this stuff if you haven't heard it before is it's tough it's hard it's hard to wrap your head around i've known about bitcoin for many years now and i'm just recently wrapping my head around this stuff and it's just recently clicked especially since i got so interested in nfts and how it related to my work so it really bore down my interest uh but the blockchain is a public ledger that's the easiest way to say it it's a place where everyone can see what's going on. There's no, there's it's no, there's no opacity. It's completely clear. You know who owns what. You know who gave what to what, because when mm -hmm. you do the transaction, it gets recorded by multiple computers, and that's what that's where all this stuff is interacting on on this programming called the blockchain. But is it is it like? It kind of when you when you say it's on the computers and it's a public ledger and all that, that makes me think of of uh, peer to peer file sharing like Napster. Remember that? 
That was the premise sure. of Napster. Like nothing lives on any one computer. Bits of it live on a multiple on multiple computers. But there is a quote ledger that says, "Hey, if you want to download Nirvana, never mind." There is a there's pieces of it all over the place, and I will assemble it for you. So there, therefore, no one's culpable, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a computer programmer, and I mm. don't. I I couldn't like. I could not write out the bitcoin code for you the the and how <laughs> how it works yeah it's it's to the best of my knowledge which is a layman's term knowledge of this stuff i am not i am not a programmer it's not that the things are living in bits and places all over the place it's just that, that many computers are recording the transaction and it's just a notation of it it's not the actual transaction so mm -hmm. The, the the point being is there's no third party in the sense that there's no third party doing the transaction meaning that when i send you we can relate this to nfts or to or to money you know if i mm -hmm. venmo you 10 bucks you got to trust that venmo is going to give you the ten dollars yeah right. and, and they're the third party if you buy my work from sotheby's or some gallery you have to trust that i'm the person that made it and that they that they are trustworthy to be able to prove that mm -hmm. and that everything they're saying about the piece is correct now with the blockchain there's no need for a third party there's no need for a bank or a venmo it's just peer-to-peer -peer transaction transactions that are being recorded and monitored by many computers on the network and that's how you no one computer can be hacked no one computer can change all of the, you know, you, you're certain that what's happening has happened. It's a little hard to wrap your brain around, but it, it, that's the essence. I, need, I, I, feel like, I feel like I need an infographic or something. <laughs> yeah, like, this is it's, it's tough, battery. Frederick. I, I yeah. would recommend people to go out there and do some due diligence and, and just try to get some easy explainers. There's a bunch of podcasts uh, on, on crypto and the blockchain that, that make things yeah. really simple and really easy to kind of understand. There's this is a very you know if people don't get it this is a very very new space it mm -hmm. is it is in its infancy and so it is not user friendly yet it is mm -hmm. uh, it is not available to the masses and that's that's because we're so early yeah. so it's not something that you can wrap your head around super easy it's not something that you can just plug in a credit card and all of a sudden you have Bitcoin it, it takes multiple steps so so don't be frustrated. It takes everyone a while to figure this stuff out. There's some people who have been on it who, from the very beginning, but they're frankly nerds, huge nerds that have right, right. a ton of ton of coding and and mathematics experience. It's not accessible to the mainstream yet, but it's going to get there. It's going to get there very soon. It feels like it feels like a lot of it is in the stage of uh, like an, an analog might be drones. Right, you remember back in the day when drones were purely in the realm of the nerds that were buying little pieces and soldering in their garage and putting it totally. together and crashing them, but they were having all the fun. And then companies like DJI jumped into it and put a shiny plastic case on it. And now it's yeah. accessible. Anybody that can just, that has the money can go fly a drone. Are we like it's, that? Is it kind of? It, I, would, I would say it's a pretty good analogy. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely in, in the space where it's, you can see some big players like Coinbase and now these, now these big NFT companies that have a ton of money behind them to try to make them more user-friendly. NBA Top Shots is a great example. NBA Top Shots is the most user-friendly experience in the space. It's the, it's the least, it the, has the smallest barrier to entry into the space. And it's mm -hmm. still, people complain about it all the time. It's still not it's not something that people enjoy the experience of per se because it's so new and they're figuring it out yeah uh, the, your your example is exactly correct you're going to see these companies with a lot of money figure it out and figure it out quickly and all of a sudden it's going to be very easy to get into the, to get into nfts to get the cryptocurrency and to get into smart contracts which are also really exciting on on the blockchain which are are you know part of this whole thing yeah it's it's really exciting. It, you're, you're this is something that we're going to be. This is something that our kids are going to not understand. Wasn't didn't exist before. <laughs> you're like, it's going to it's going to be like the along? internet to them. You know, they're just, yeah. just going to say, "Oh, this is just part of what it is. This is just what happens." 
Yeah, you know what? It's interesting. This is a perfect segue into the meat of this conversation, which is the the NFT side of things, and just where where that stuff is going. And it, it's here. Here's a here's a good way to set the stage. A friend of mine and I were having a conversation maybe about eighteen months, two years ago, about. It was, a, it was one of those, wouldn't it be cool if conversations, he's another photographer, like, wouldn't it be cool if you could use um, cryptocurrency or the blockchain to, to add value to limited edition photographic works? And this wasn't, the conversation wasn't around digital, it was just around prints. Like if you got, you want to do a limited edition of Jesse Dittmar's, you know, Jodie Foster shot, you're only going to print 12 of them, period. You want a price on, you're going to destroy the raw file after that. How do you, how does the person buying that know that that what they have is one of 12 and it's not one of 1200 and you're just saying it's one of 12. So the conversation was around that. Fast forward to today and that idea has realized and been extended to digital. Right. So now you could sell a picture of Jodie Foster if you wanted to. I'm going to share my screen here um, of your open C page. Right. So yep. you could you have you've created all of these these NFTs. Right. So take us through this, Jesse. <laughs> take us through like this is the realization of the limited edition print, but only in the well, in this case, in the ether. Right. In the digital world. I love that summation, Frederick, because that's exactly why this excites me. Mm -hmm. This is a situation where because of the blockchain, because of the open source, the, the transparency in the blockchain, I own ditmar.eth, which is basically like a domain name. And that's tied to my wallet. That's tied to this page that you're looking at here. And so if I mint, which is another way of saying make, and I say I'm going to make 23 Serena Williams like I have here said that I'm going to make. But all of a sudden I make 2300. You can see that it's it's available for anyone to see. Mm. So therefore, you can't you're not wondering as a collector. Oh, geez, what what if he made 10 times a thousand times the amount that he said he was going to make or she. It, it's all open as long as it comes from my wallet it, and it has to come from my wallet or else, you know, it's not mine. And that's another way to prove authenticity. So it, it is, that's exactly where we're at. And mm -hmm. I think that I, going forward myself, all of my future gallery prints will be offered, will have corresponding blockchain non-pungible tokens associated with them to prove ownership. I think that going forward in the gallery space, you're going to see any major artist accompanying their physical works with associated blockchain proof of ownership. It's not going to be tomorrow, but it's going to be ubiquitous soon. So if I, in the future, in the near future, if I go into a gallery in San Francisco and there's a, there's a work on the wall, I'm like, I got to have that. I got to have that in my living room. I will be able to buy that. If it's an original work, I could buy a one of, or if it's, a, if it's one of many, I could buy a numbered version of that. Um, but then are you saying that that one will be authenticated or the digital version of that will be authenticated? I, I believe based on the way the technology operates currently, and this could absolutely change, but I believe that when you buy the physical thing on the wall, you will also be sent the token, the digital token to mm -hmm. prove that you, uh, the pr to prove that the physical thing on the wall is authentic and is what you say it is going forward. If you think about it, we're having tons of pieces of art come up from, you know, it, this is how art forgers work. They create art that looks like a masterwork. They try to get it authenticated. They can't figure out, they try to figure out the lineage of ownership back to the 17th century for Vermeer. And they can't do it because records are lost. This happens, that happens, yada, yada, yada. In yeah. the future, if you say, I own this Jesse Dittmar print of Tom Brady, and 150 years and you want to sell it, if you don't have the non-fungible token, then you don't, then what you're telling me on the wall, I don't believe you. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be the crux is I, I want the thing on the wall, but the thing that proves that that is authentic is the non-fungible token that's in your wallet, because you can't send that to someone or give that to someone without it being recorded on a public ledger. 
So it's not, it's impossible for the, where that ownership of that digital item could be lost. The physical item could be lost. And, you know, you can start talking about how you can get into a collegiate discussion about what happens in the future with this stuff. But in my brain, it's all about the branding. And I think in the future, if you don't have the corresponding token, which is essentially a serial number. That's the way I like to explain it for people who are not yeah. in on these terms. If you don't have the corresponding serial number in your wallet, which is a digital wallet, it's you know a little bit difficult to explain, but it's called a wallet for a reason. It's somewhat something like a wallet. Mm -hmm. Wherever that serial number lives and whatever wallet that is, if you own that wallet, you own that art. And I think that's how people are gonna be able to prove ownership of not just art, but property, any anything that could be contested ownership or authentic or authenticated in the future so just to rewind a little bit looking at non-fungible tokens nfts which is what this webinar is about what is that <laughs> right what is what is a that, that acronym non-fungible sure. token right sure. well, tell us get let's get to the bottom of that first so the the basic way to do that is to compare it to to money uh, the best ex the best uh, example is if you have a dollar bill, I, you can trade it for my dollar bill, and it's both worth a dollar. If you have a piece of a Bitcoin, it doesn't matter what Bitcoin you have. It just matters that you have a Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. That's that's what we you call fungible tokens on on the the blockchain. Money, things that look exactly the same have the same value. Non fungible tokens have. Are, are one of one of a kind like the 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 non-fungible token means that it can't be the one i have is not the one you have it's it's really like a serial number it's it mm -hmm. is as if you have the number one lamborghini of 2500 made mm -hmm. and you can know that based on the public ledger it, it it's a little bit complicated again it's hard to completely wrap your head around but Humans, you and I, we're non-fungible. There's only Frederick, there's only Jesse Dittmar. They're one yeah. of one, they're unique. But fungible tokens, which are basically money, crypto money, and you can build that out to any analogy you want. Yeah. They have value as well, but they're not, they're, it doesn't matter which one you have per se. So I many hope questions. That, I, I hope that <laughs> explains it a bit. It does. The best does. example I can give you is that a non-fungible token is like owning a digital serial number. That's it. So then that digital serial number can be applied to any number of things though, right? So we were, we started the conversation talking about limited edition prints, right? From a photographer mm -hmm. standpoint, that can be extended to digital prints as well, or just images, right? So that yeah. that serial number could be like your, your shot of Tom Brady or Serena Williams or you know any of these famous people you could you could create a jpeg or like you have on your page here animated gifs or a cinemagraph of one of those people and apply a non-fungible token serial number to it now that that whoever owns that has the original so then the question i know a lot of people are thinking is this is all digital right yeah what how come i can't you know, command C, command V, and now I have two Tom Brady's, you know, I just doubled my money, right? How do, how do I do that? It, I t that was my first reaction. Mm -hmm. I got into this on NBA Top Shots. If you don't know what that is, go check it out. It's, it's, it's digital trading cards. They are free videos of basketball plays that people are selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars on the internet. It is bonkers. And it is NBA hard. NBA Top Shots. Top it is hard okay. to wrap your head around the fact that someone just paid actual dollars for something they can go you look up on YouTube for free. That is a difficult, that's a difficult ask. But then when you start thinking about it, you go, okay, so if I want to put the Mona Lisa in my office, I can go on, on Google and Google the Mona Lisa and print it out and put it on my wall. And I can, I can actually, there's really high resolution versions of the Mona Lisa that the Louvre puts on their website for free, but that doesn't mean I own the Mona Lisa on my wall. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's it's not. You, you have to remember with 
anything that denotes value. And this is, hard, uh, this is hard to wrap your head around because it sounds silly, but anything donates, that donates value is just because someone is willing to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. Your computer, right. your, dollar. your dollar, your house, your car, your iPhone, water, beer, or soda. You photographs know, <laughs> you know. just because someone thinks it's stupid and it says i can go look at it for free doesn't mean that someone else doesn't think it's valuable i yeah. personally couldn't give two cents for a prada handbag obviously but i but people are buying them for thousands of dollars so it's, yeah. it's the same concept yeah it has value because people believe it is valuable just like money just like anything when you're when you're talking pixels though cuz we're in, we're in the pixel world right and it's art is pixels these days or everything is pixels or data or binary right so so if you're if you're looking at it from that standpoint there's a couple of different things that that pop up i'm sure you've considered this too so if you have it, i think it goes back to that authenticity piece of it so if i have if i've purchased a Jesse Dipmar you know Sophie shot right i'm looking at your page here which is you know at your open so you, you're linking to this from jessedittmar.com right so people can get to your the actually the best way to link to it is through my instagram it's directly linked okay. it's my main link on my instagram uh, and i'll put it i'll put a link in the chat too just for folks so you can go check these and out. you can also you can also just google open c jesse Dittmar, or there's a couple places ways to get it okay so if i if i buy one of these right if i go in like okay i want to try this first of all how the hell do I do that, right? So I'm looking at it. Okay, I see a number and I think I have 0. 0.0868 of a cent to buy a Tom Brady. Is that now, what that that's is? Point oh, that's 0. 0.086 of an ETH, which is Explain. a couple hundred dollars. So I don't want to get bogged down in this too much, Frederick, because it's... Yeah this is this is the main issue this is the main issue in the space right now if you want to go bid on my tom brady portrait which has been bid on by mark cuban actually this morning which is oh. really exciting awesome. uh, i know and and a couple other people it's got five or six bids if you want to go do that you frederick cannot do that right now if you are not set up for crypto it okay. is it is not accessible and that is the most frustrating thing that is the most frustrating thing about this whole process as a creator and as a consumer, that if I see something cool that I like, I just can't whip out my chase card and put in my punch in my numbers. And now I'm, I'm onboarded with the process. Why not? It's complicated. It's a, it's a multi-day onboarding process if you're just starting out, which stinks. It stinks really hard because you have to, the best thing I can say is there is an open sea explainer and there's multiple YouTube videos on how to set up an OpenSea, how to set up an NFT, how to set up a crypto wallet. But it's it's real it's realistically a four step process, and depending on what state you live in, what country you live in, it's there's different laws which make it more or less difficult. But for me, it took about three days to get set up to be able to purchase, bid, or make NFTs. And the way you've got to do that, I'll just give you the real quick bullet points, is the first thing you have to do is get a digital digital wallet, which you can get through this place called MetaMask, but there's, there's literally dozens of options for digital wallets. MetaMask is the best thing that interfaces with all of these websites that is currently out there. I do not think it's what's going to be the thing that is long-term the answer, but... If you have a wallet, you have a wallet. It doesn't matter what platform it goes through per se. So you got to get a MetaMask. That's kind of annoying. Then you have to put Ethereum in it, which is difficult, which is, you know, Ether money. Uh, it's, it's digital currency. It's what, it's what you bid on for these things. Depending on where you live, that's hard. In New York State, where I live, you can't just buy Ethereum with your credit card through certain places you have to buy them through authorized licensed places so then you have to go to an exchange which is coinbase that's the second part uh and you have to get ethereum through coinbase get it into your wallet and then you can start bidding or buying 
that whole process is annoying. It's annoying for me to even talk about it. It's confusing. I bet people didn't understand what I just said. Yeah. I get that. I it's a learning curve. It's a it's learning, a learning curve. curve, right? And yeah. if you want to get into the space, you'll have to climb it. You'll have to climb that curve. But once you're there and once you're onboarded, then it's fun to it's fun to mess around with. It's it, it, once you're in the space, you're going to be at, still at the vanguard of this thing. I, it's still in the early phases. I, it's even though it's blowing up and it's getting it's getting its first mainstream press ever, and that's only getting people interested in the concept. It's not getting people into the into the space. Mm -hmm. As soon as someone figures out how to make it easy to do this, it's it's going to be exponential growth. Does that someone the so it, it sounds like this is a, a a fertile garden waiting on a killer app to sort of democratize the onboarding process. So are we waiting on a Chase Bank or a Stripe or a PayPal or someone to to jump in and say, hey, get your whatever card and all that stuff that you used to have to do last month? It's all in this card and it's a one step process. That's really tough, Frederick. I, I can't tell you honestly that I know how that will happen because yeah. there's a lot of friction. The whole foundation of cryptocurrency and the blockchain was to disassociate third parties mm -hmm. uh, from the process. So in order to simplify the process, third parties have to come back in. And so you're giving up what the fabric of the co concept of the blockchain and cryptocurrency is if you have a big player come into the space and make it easy. For yeah. instance, again, NBA Top Shots, it's all based on block blockchain, blockchain technology. However, you have to trust that NBA Top Shots is gonna give you your money when you wanna get it out. Yeah. And that's, that's the main issue. So it's, it's unclear, these players that you already mentioned, PayPal, Venmo, Robinhood, these players are already in the crypto space. You're allowed to buy cryptocurrency from them. However, it's not real crypto because you're not able to send and receive it from them. Mm -hmm. So these companies, Chase Banks, they're already in the space. They're buying crypto. They're, get, they're get staking positions in Bitcoin. They are certainly exploring what's going on. I don't know anyone in those, in those places high up, but they have to, if you look at just what they're doing, the writings on the wall, they're going to blockchain technology in some capacity. I don't know who's going to be able to to make it to make it user friendly. It's going to happen. It's going to have to happen, or else yeah. the technology won't. Some something will happen where it is accessible to the masses. It's impossible to say what that is. Do you do you as a, as a content creator, as an artist, and someone who's you know an early adopter of this technology? Do you feel like photographers should be embracing it now, even if they're not planning on monetizing their work? And the, the impetus of that question is, you know, there's always the, the worry that as soon as I upload this photo to the web or put it on Facebook, now these 50 page long terms of service somewhere in there means Facebook owns my image and all this stuff. Is this a viable way to safeguard against that en masse or is it too much of a, too many hot coals per serial number to walk over? I, I don't personally look at it like that. I, I'm a professional photographer. I don't, I don't, I do not pay attention to that stuff, to, to Facebook stealing my pictures. You know, it's, I'm, I'm privileged to be able to say that because yeah. I, have a, I have a known entity I am a, I am a known entity and people, Facebook can't use one of my photos in their advertisement and say, oh, I uploaded it to Facebook. It, they, they lose the loss. Yeah. So, uh, so it doesn't bother me. I don't consider the NFT space a space that is gonna protect my copyright. I consider it a, a democratizing platform in order for me to be able to sell my work to my, to, to, to my followers and my fans. Yeah, they don't right. have to. They don't have to come to a gallery. They can go to my gallery on OpenSea. It's mine, and they can get it. And they know That's it comes so from me because they know it's my wallet. And they don't yeah. have to. They don't have to worry about 
oh geez, is he is is Jesse gonna make a million more of these? Uh, because even if I do make a million more of those, they can prove they have the first one. And mm -hmm. like, if I change my mind, they still have proof that what they had was exclusive. Now, yeah, could someone screw with that or mess with that equation in some way? In some way, I'm not thinking about. Is there fraud out there? Is there? Is there? Is this? Is this foolproof? Absolutely not. But yeah. I don't. I don't personally consider this a protection of the copyright. Yeah. Well, we don't. We I don't frankly, know Frederick. Don't know. I, I mean, I know this is a little, uh, a little uh, against the grain in the photography community. I do not value my copyright as much as some people. I just think that it is, at the end of the day, people know my work, and some of my contracts with the with my publications are shared copyright. The New York Times could go put cover of a photograph that I've made on a book and they don't they don't have to ask me wow but that's part of the deal and it doesn't matter to me because I'm getting the opportunity to photograph the people these I'm getting opportunity to do the job I love I still own the copyright yep I still can do my own thing with it I yep. uh, to me if you're gonna stress out about your copyright on every single situation and you're worried about uploading your work onto Facebook or one of these platforms that that all of a sudden this corporation owns your work, then you're just putting roadblocks in front of your career that are your own making. Yeah, uh, yeah, you retiring. can't, you just got to make work. You just got to be focused on the work, make work. I love that. I love that. So speaking of that though, so I don't know if this is now or in the, maybe it's in the future, but do you see, do you see a time when this stuff is sort of sharp enough or, or come to a point enough where you know, as a, any photographer that owns, say, Lightroom can export to an open sea with an automated process where, okay, I got this image, I'm ready for it to go. I want this on my open sea gallery, file export to open sea. It's up there. It's got a, it's got its serial number. It's ready to go. Do you, is that, is that the holy grail of how we want to get to? Well, you can do that now. Okay. It's, it's not that easy. It's not as easy yeah. as you just explained, but you could, that's what I did. I mean, for the most part, it, it's, it's been a little more complicated than that, obviously. Uh, but that's exactly what you can do now. Do I think that process will ever be completely free and just one click? It's just the same as putting a posting on Instagram. Probably not, but I've already heard, I think Mark Cuban's working on a social media NFT platform where when you do post, it automatically makes it an NFT and people can purchase it. I heard that's in the works already. So I refuse to predict how this technology is going to evolve. Yeah, I'm just really excited about the core concept of the technology. And I, and I feel very strongly about the fact that wherever this goes, this is what we're, the, the underlying technology of NFTs and smart contracts is what we're gonna be using. I think that we're gonna have smart contracts in between photographers and publications in the future. I yeah. think there's, I think that's how you're gonna get paid. I, I just think that you're gonna all, all of a sudden, the, you're, when you upload the images, the smart contract completes and, and Ethereum or Bitcoin or USDC, which is, cryptocurrency tied to the US dollar gets deposited in your wallet. And that's, that's it. I, I think that that's where things are going. So I don't know how long it will take to get there. I don't know exactly what it will look like. I'm sure that there will be a lot of road bumps and zigzags along the way, especially when the US government starts getting into this more because they do not want a currency like Bitcoin competing with the US dollar. Right. But it'll get there eventually and whatever it looks like it's going to use this technology. I love that. There's so much to learn with this stuff. And there's so many, each of the questions I ask you could have a, that's a, that's a whole conversation in and of itself. Um, there's so much to learn I, for me, for me to learn too, Frederick. I mean, I'm yeah. sure that there are people in this chat who might know more about crypto and the blockchain than I do. I am not the biggest expert. I'm not a complete newbie either. I'm trying to, I'm trying to walk the line of having some knowledge in the space, being really excited about it, making work in it. Uh, but but certainly there are more learned people out there to talk about the, the coding of it, the future of it, 
security. I, I have a that. general feeling of positivity. I have a general feeling of this is where I should be going. This is how I should be offering my work up to people because I think that eventually this is the only way people are going to want to have it. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I see, you know, a lot of, we see a lot of technologies come and go, right. And a lot of, a lot of, it's like fireworks in Silicon Valley, right? Sure. <laughs> but it's interesting that you you don't often see such big names attached to these fireworks, like Mark Cuban, like Gary Vaynerchuk, and on and on and on. That uh, that you watch videos, or I watch videos from these guys, including yourself, you know. And I when when you, in this conversation, you can feel the you can feel the excitement and the bullishness from people that are smart right it's not just irrational exuberance it is you can need to you need to learn about this stuff which makes you know you you describe the the onboarding process the four whatever step process to kind of getting into it it reminded me of uh stephen king's pet cemetery you remember that <laughs> so in pet cemetery if you read the book there i think it's in the movie too but there's this this thicket of stuff that you have to get through in order to get to the pet cemetery it's purposely there to make a barrier to entry yeah. it feels like we're at that point right now where there's a thick barrier to entry to getting through which means only a certain determined smart people that understand and have the time and the money to go through that thicket are going to do it ultimately yeah. that thicket will go away but right now it's acting sort of as a natural barrier do you agree with that I couldn't agree more, Frederick. It, yeah. There is absolutely a barrier. It takes it takes being open minded. It, it's like trying to learn a new computer program. It's the way I felt when I first opened up Photoshop. What is going on in here? I don't even I don't know what half of these buttons do, let alone how to get to them. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's like learning a new language. It is something that is completely attainable. However, it does take a little bit of an effort. Now, listen, it's not, let's not, let's not kid ourselves. This is not the most, the difficult thing in the world. Uh, you know, it took, it took me to onboard my OpenSea and get my wallet set up. It probably took me an hour of real time minutes over a three day period with a lot of frustrating trial and error. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, I thought I'd be able to do this. Oh, this is what would not, I would naturally click on, but that's not what I'm supposed to click on. Uh, wh what's this term? What's a gas fee? What, like, why am I being charged a fee here? Why am I being charged a fee? I feel like I'm being a charge a fee at every single turn. Uh, so there are those frustrations, but we're talking about an hour of your time over a few day period. If you have, if you have a credit card, you can get cryptocurrency. You can only get a limited amount, but if you have a credit card, you can get cryptocurrency and you can make it happen. So I wouldn't say I would, there is a barrier and a hurdle to entry, but I would not deter people out there from trying because it is doable. There are a million explainers on the internet on how to do it. Uh, it just takes a little, it just takes a little gumption, a little fortitude. And then you can you can be in be in the game. We should call it the uh, the Jesse Dittmar Jack Snyder Justice League challenge. So four hour <laughs> movie. If you can start the movie with your laptop, you know, in front of the movie, <laughs> and go yeah. through and learn while the movie's on, and by the end of that movie, you should be an expert in sure. blockchain and NFT and all these technologies. You're allowed. You're allowed to pause the movie while these companies uh, uh, verify your identity and things like that. Yeah. yeah. No. Absolutely. So, yeah. As we wrap this up, we'll move into Q and A in a second. So, folks, if you have a question that you want to ask about NFT or or otherwise interject, go ahead and put it in the chat or in the Q&A section. I see there's a couple of questions in there now. Go ahead and throw that in there. We're gonna be wrapping up on the hour here. So get them in there now. Um, Jesse, what a couple of last questions from me. You may or may not know the answer to this, but one of the concerns that I would have of, of sort of investing and leaning into something like this would be, A, is our wallets transferable? You know, so, can I give my wallet or everything in it to someone else? And how does how does that work? And then B, what happens if, you know, I get hit by a plane or an asteroid or something tomorrow and I've got a significant amount of wealth locked up in in this in NFTs and blockchain and Ethereum and all that? 
how what's the flow for that to get to my loved ones well okay again i want to preference that i am not a yeah. i have an answer yeah, you're just for the you. guy you're just a guy I have, that's a, doing I have an answer for you but I, I i do not pretend to be a cybersecurity expert but sure. I, I would recommend everyone out there to get a password manager first of all i use dashlane the answer to your question is that wallets are transferable if someone has the has the password if someone has your key they can have your they can open your wallet and they can own it they can do whatever they want with it so in your situation in the in the fictitious uh, horrific accident you just need to make sure your loved ones know how to get your password and then if they have your address to your wallet and your password then they can get in it and uh and that's as simple as that um so in that sense wallets are transferable but anything in the wallet is transferable so if you want to gift an nft to someone or if you want to give someone cryptocurrency or whatever, uh, you just have to have their wallet address and send it to them. Uh, yeah, and send, send it just like that. Just okay. send it just like that. So you can have multiple wallets if you want. So I could have. No, you can. Have, there's nothing regulating that. You can have. I think I have four or five wallets. I don't even know why. Just because I just because I was trying to figure out which one I liked. Uh, you know, I had wallets for various reasons because different wallets work best with different platforms, and so. The my favorite way to keep keep track of all this stuff personally is Dashlane as a password manager, which is not perfect but works. And I use Personal Capital for all of my financial accounts under one place. They have a cryptocurrency option where you can put in there that you have this wallet and you own this much uh, cryptocurrency. I don't think they have an option for NFTs yet, but it'll get there. Yeah, yeah, so much to learn. It's, it's it's exciting. I love talking about this stuff because there's it, it's it, it, whenever we turn over a leaf, there's multiple leaves underneath that. You're like, where where is all this it, going? And it's a you big were talking space. About, it it's is. Yeah, space. you were talking and, about and the contract. wallets are kind of like an account. It's like a it's like mm -hmm. a, imagine a wallet like owning a PayPal account, okay. but but there's just no third party. You just you just own it. It's just yours. There's nobody nobody else. It, that's one of the big big worries in cryptocurrency is that if you lose your password there's no resetting your password it's you now cannot get into that wallet and you will never you with current technology you never will be able to maybe something changes in the future where people can hack into wallets but it, it is it is yours and you have to have that password written down somewhere and you better hope that no one that you don't want to have it gets it it's it's very serious in that way wow wow um yeah this is this is like the the the, bl the brain explodes when you start thinking about the possibilities one yeah. last question i have before we dive into this Q these q a i know i keep saying that but the um what kinds of things can can you apply this nft serial number to is it images is it physical world things is and then where i'm going with that is the the security of it so if if i say I decide, you know what? I want to make an NFT from the very first episode of This Week in Photo. You yeah, know, that podcast, you could. I want to make that. But then what stops, the, there, there's millions of those episodes out there right now, right? Yeah. On, on devices all over the place. What makes mine special, right? Because you own the serial number that's tied to it. A, a great why example. Can't, why can't John Doe or someone else that has that file run it through and say i own that this is the number because one because you they can and that's the that's one of the big problems in the space right now people have to know that you are frederick mm -hmm. and that what you're offering as an nft is the original item a absolutely someone could right now take all of my branding off the web go onto a different platform than OpenSea, like rareable or mintable there's tons of them and set up an account and pretend to be me and try to sell my stuff. These third parties are now working on trying to verify people like Twitter, as mm. a, like Twitter and Instagram does. Uh, the key component is that the people that whoever is purchasing or trading or, or dealing with your NFTs knows who the originator uh, is and trusts that that person is the originator. And the yeah. bigger the person becomes, like a Beeple or a different, a different artist in the NFT space, no one can sell a Beeple and, and, 
and rip it off and uh, and scam you because if you do your due diligence, because you can find out what people's address is and see if the things that the person is trying to sell you came from that address. And if it doesn't come from that address, it's not a people. If it doesn't come from that address, it's not a Jesse Dittmar. If someone is buying the first episode of This Week in Photo and it doesn't come from Frederick Van Johnson's address, it's not the first week in Week in Photo. Yeah, uh, and love that. This is a great example of someone just did, uh, Jack Dorsey just did this with the very first tweet ever tweeted. Uh, he, 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 he screenshotted it and sold it as an NFT for something like $9 million or $3 million. I don't know exactly how much it was, but yeah, I could also screenshot the tweet and try to sell it as an NFT, but I'm not Jack Dorsey. So right. hopefully no one gives, gives a, a, a crap. Yeah. So the seller, the seller and the authentication together is that one, two punch of this thing is real and has gravity and mass and you want to buy it. Right. It's just like a, just like an art gallery. When you when you buy something from Sotheby's, you're you're expecting that it's real because you think Sotheby's do the, did the due diligence. Now there's no longer Sotheby's involved. It's a, it's a wallet address. You need to believe that that wallet address is from the original creator. Yeah, yeah. So much the mind boggles, man. Because you know, like you said, contracts. I could see a, a, tons of things being. Yeah, or, or or ways that we need to prove something be fueled by this, like diplomas right oh yeah <laughs> so all, oh absolutely all that kind of stuff yeah so absolutely. a school an educational institution could instead of just giving you a piece of paper they give you a piece of paper and an nft code to prove that you got this versus exactly. somebody just printing one right that's an amazing example that i hadn't thought of i actually i want nyu to send me my diploma nft i'm, I'm bummed now that i only have a piece of paper on the wall that says i went to nyu i, I want to I, I, anybody can print that out. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, there's so much stuff. Well, cool, man. Let's, you, you ready to take some questions? Yeah, let's do it. I'm not All reading right. them. Do you want to read them or do you want me to no, read them or do you want? I'll do it. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Uh, I'm looking in the chat first and then I'll move into the Q&A. Stan Robbins says, can a single creator have multiple wallets containing an NFT of a particular creation? There, uh, uh, as far as I know, the physical NFT, the code can only live in one wallet. There's no way to split it up. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you can own multiple wallets, but the same NFT cannot be in more than one place at one time. Okay. Okay. I love that. Interesting. And what does it cost? Like you, you have what half a dozen? No, you got eight, nine or a ton up here on your site per like the Tom Brady, how much did it cost to put that Tom Brady up there so that Mark Cuban could bid on it? Right. So it's the, it's not a straightforward answer. Every platform has different, there's, there's ways out there to compare the platforms and their fees. What I like about OpenSea is that it is basically a one-time fee to set up, to put, to list work. So I mm -hmm. listed my Tom Brady to start, and now I can list as many things as I want forever on OpenSea for free. Uh, so it was a one-time fee. Their fees can catch you in other ways. This is not a fee-less process. And you are going to have to accept that there is going to be, I've probably spent somewhere in the range of three to $500 setting up everything, by, including the, the Ethereum that I purchased. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not, there, there are fees at every turn. They're called gas fees. They're basically, they're, they're necessary. They're baked in. You won't go anywhere that has zero fees right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can list something new for nothing, um, but to, to get it all started for me was a couple hundred dollars. Okay, okay. And then if, if I buy one of yours from, from your OpenSea page, where does it go? Do I need to have an OpenSea page or do I need to have- No, need you just need a wallet. Just a wallet and, and that Tom Brady shows up in my wallet. It's in your wallet and you can do what you okay. want with it. You can display it. You can, sh you can share your wallet to, to your social media and say, hey, I own, I own the one of one Tom Brady, Jesse Dittmar and nobody else does. So that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's in my wallet, it, but it's in my wallet alongside my other- Whatever else you have. Yeah. My, my Bitcoin, my, my yep. Ethereum, my whatever- they're all in they're alongside all in, in that one wallet. I mean, you can, like we've discussed, you can have multiple wallets. So if you want to have yeah. a wallet only for your NFT collection, because you don't want people to know how much Bitcoin you have, 
yeah. uh, because you don't want everyone to know how you're a billionaire already, which I, by the way, I'm going to be Venmoing you some Bitcoin requests because of your, of your large crypto wealth, Frederick. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it, you, you can have a wallet specifically for your NFTs or whatever you want. Uh, so then you can publicly display what you want to display. You don't have to let people know that you own the specific wallet. It, there's, it, that's a tangent that we don't need to go down per se. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So interesting. Okay, let's take some some questions from the Q&A window here. There's four questions in here. Uh, Karen Sweeney. Hey, Karen. Karen's a member of the TWIP Pro community. She says, can you see a time when amateur or semi-pro photographers with zero, zero notoriety use NFTs to provide photographic content with no printing to be used as stock images, for example. So you have notoriety, other people that have big social media following, sure, get into it, tell people about it. You're minting cash, right? It feels like. What about somebody that has zero Twitter followers or is not active on social? Well, Karen, I think what you imply there, which is an interesting thought experiment, is how it could help you with uh, with the copyright that we were talking about before, where say you do a wedding, say that you want to uh, license out some of your images, you have those images tied to a smart contract with a place like Getty, and Getty cannot license out that image without money being deposited in your wallet. And, and you can see a scenario in which people have to include proof of purchase via a crypto wallet to be using your image. And if they don't have that, then they owe you money and it's easy to sue. Uh, so I can see that happening in the future for any photographer. The, the bottom line is, you know, there's no reason why an amateur can't mint their own NFTs and photographs and get them out there. I mean, I think that uh, you don't need to be a famous photographer in order to do this. Uh, and yeah, the value proposition might be different for you as, a, as an amateur photographer, but if it's a space that you want to get into and learn about, I, I say, why not go for it uh, and, get, and give it a shot? But you're right. I don't see, listen, I'm a, I'm a, I, I consider myself a well-known photographer and people aren't spending thousands and thousands of dollars on my NFTs right now. So uh, not yet, at least. And I, although I hope and expect that they do, will in the future. So I can imagine there would be amateur photographers that could go through this whole process, and yeah, they'll they could be disappointed that they're not getting any any money out of it. But I'm not doing it for the money, really. I'm I'm doing it because I'm excited about the technology, and I feel like this is a space I want to be in. Yeah, no, for sure, and it, and it's clear it's a clear path of if you're creating digital content or content period, you need to at least understand the space, right? Yeah. And and even if you're not playing in it right now, you need to understand it. Uh, here's a really good question from Welton Dolby the third. He says, "How is how is this digital currency income taxed? Do you know?" Yeah, uh, Welton. You said his name was. Yes, Welton. Uh, Welton, you know, again, no tax expert, so don't hold me to it. But uh, the IRS, from what I know, is getting really good at being able to determine uh, who owns what wallet. And so, although it's not explicitly tied to you, uh, there are rules. I would I would suggest going to the IRS website. I've looked through them myself. There are rules about cryptocurrency and the NFTs. They're very new, so I expect them to change. But the, the short answer is yes. Certain transactions with crypto, monetary crypto, NFTs are taxable transactions. I believe right now they require you to report that yourself. It's self-regulated. And, you know, I think that's the kind of thing that if you're a big collector and you have a lot of buzz about you or whatever, if you're, be if you're again, Beeple, for instance, who is the biggest NFT artist in the space right now, yeah, the tax man's going to be expecting, uh, going to be expecting a sizable uh, donation uh, mm -hmm. from, from him this year. Uh, so I don't want to answer that in the definitive because, I, again, I'm not an expert, but there are resources out there to go find that information, specifically yeah. on the IRS website. Yeah, yeah. And all, the, all these questions, yeah, follow up and research them. Like, I have questions around, um, like, money laundering, for example. Not that I want to launder money, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> but is, is this a viable route for someone that needs to launder a bunch of cash is to dump it over here and then extract it in some other way? You know, it's possible. It's not something that I'm thinking about. Of sure. course, anything's possible. Criminals anything find possible. all different kinds of platforms and ways to be criminals. 
Humans. I'm worried about making photography, not worried about mon laundering money right now. Yep. But if you want to talk offline about a business venture you haven't told me about, I'm interested. Yeah, yeah. I got I got an offer you can't refuse, Jesse Bitmar. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Uh, Here's a question from Jim Max. He says, I like your thoughts about not worrying so much about protecting copyrights a lot. I hate putting my copyright photo by on everything. Should I go through my entire website and remove those? How much cryptocurrency would I need to get started doing this? So taking your entire website. Those are two website, different questions. My yeah. short answer is absolutely get your copyright off your images on your website. There's, again, I'm a working professional photographer and I don't, when someone steals my images, I only care if they're gonna owe me a lot of money for it. And mm -hmm. I also pay other companies to go out there and fight my copyright battles for me. So, and even then it's not a life-changing amount of money. It's not worth it. It's not worth degrading your images with Stress, yeah. stupid watermarks. Just get rid of them. You know, it's just, Look, what I like to say is look at the people who are the best photographers in the business, the artists that you look up to, the artists that you admire, the artists you wanna be. For me, it was Annie Leibovitz, it was Martin Scholler, these photographers that are living and photographers that are, have passed, they don't have websites with their copyright Annie Leibovitz on it. Right. They just don't. And so there's a reason for that. You don't need it. and. I don't know what the what the press what the uh, press uh, what the um, what's the word motivation is for someone to go do that. Put the copy. I guess it's because they're trying to say, "Don't steal this." But guess what? People are going to steal it anyways if they want to steal it. It's mm -hmm. Photoshop. You can't be worried about copyright if you want to grow your photography career. You just can't. Yeah, I love that. I love you. I love your 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 thoughts on that. That's amazing. And the second part uh, of this question: How much? How much? Uh, 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 crypto? Do you need to make this happen? Mm -hmm. The answer is a couple hundred dollars. I mean, I I think I put uh, in order to get this whole thing started, maybe like a quarter of an of an ETH, a quarter of an Ethereum token, uh, something like that. A third, you know, if you want to be listen, I would just buy an Ethereum token. I know they're expensive. If you can afford it, you know, I don't want to I don't want to tell anyone to do anything outside their means. But mm -hmm. you know, this stuff is not it's not going away and. I, I see it only going up in value in the long term. So I personally would just buy an Ethereum token and just say, okay, I've got enough. Because you pay little fees every time you do stuff. So just get 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 it, get something and forget about it. And then you'll wake up in 10 years and be like, oh my God, Ethereum's worth 10,000 a token. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Some people are waking up today thinking that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple more questions here. I think we answered this one already from Stan Robbins. Stan says, can a creator have multiple wallets containing an NFT of a particular creation? And I think the answer is no, right? Because uh, it can only live in one wallet at a time. Yeah, it's a serial number. It can only live in one place. It can only live in one, one only one place can, can own it at a time, one wallet. And okay. the great thing about, the, about uh, Ethereum smart contract technology is that the equation the mathematic equation is a yet is a simplified is a complicated but in a simplified version a yes and equation meaning that you do not get the the serial number into your wallet unless i get the money into my wallet and both things need to exist and be true kind of like an electrical circuit for the transaction to go through so that's what's really cool about it it's 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 a positive and a negative that when you send someone Bitcoin, it's permanent. There's no taking it back. It's done. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing when you swap an NFT for Ethereum, it's over. There's no swap backs. Uh, so if someone claims to have, you have to believe and trust that the person has the NFT in their wallet uh, in order for you to want to make that transaction happen. Now, OpenSea and these third-party platforms are good for proving that that is the case, but you know, scammers are already trying to go around that by selling NFTs on eBay and saying, Bitcoin me to this wallet and I'll send you the NFT. And it's like, don't do any of that. Mm, yeah, the Nigerian scammers are like rubbing their hands together. Like, okay, yeah. It's, people are gonna get scammed, it's gonna happen. Uh, but if you have some street smarts and some digital smarts, you'll, you'll avoid it. Uh, yeah. You know, you won't be the first person. 
Yeah. There'll yeah. be other people talking about it on, on, on the internets. Yeah. There's always, there's always something. Here's the last question. You ready for this one? It's from another hey. one from, from Jim, Jim Max. He says, do you get a, do you uh, get a statement from the company you have a wallet with? Do they, do they send you some sort of ledger or breakdown every month of what, what you have in the wallet and what it's worth and all that? No, no. I mean, uh, well, frankly, Jim, I'm not sure. There might be wallets out there that do that. It's very possible that you can, that you can get a, a statement, like a bank statement from someone. It's very possible. Uh, however, the wallets I've used don't operate like that, or I have not found that functionality. Uh, the, the, what you have to, what you're kind of not understanding in the implication of the question is that they don't own the wallet. You own the wallet. They don't mm -hmm. have access to it. It's not like my wallet lives on some single server that MetaMask, who is my wall, who who is the person is the platform that I interface. I interface with my wallet through MetaMask, but MetaMask doesn't know my password. It doesn't know my. It doesn't. It doesn't have on a MetaMask server everything that's in my wallet. Everything that's in my wallet is across many servers and many ledgers. That's the whole concept of blockchain. So mm -hmm. it's one of the hardest things to wrap your head around. And one of the biggest problems that there's going to be in this space of making it easily accessible is that there is really a decentralized ownership of a, a ledger. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very, there's no third party, the man that owns your stuff and that, that moves your stuff around. You do. Uh, and it's kind of hard to wrap your head around that because everything we interface with as modern humans, we interface basically in the digital world. We may, we interface basically through major third-party corporations like Google, Facebook, Instagram, major banks. You know, this is this is a very novel niche concept uh, that is kind of challenging to get your head around. I hope yeah. that answered your question, Jim. He says, he says, uh, he followed up. He says, I was asking in reference to owing the feds taxes. So, you know, how do, like, how do you account for all this stuff in a, in a trackable way that, that the federal government would look at as authentic? Well, again, you have to, the, the, the feds have no way of officially knowing you, you right now are not required to report your, wallet number ID to the feds, but you're required to report your your certain taxable transactions. So, you know, as far as it sounds like you're asking like how will the feds know that I bought an NFT? They won't unless they want to find out and then they can try to find out. And typically most people can be found out because of digital paper trails. Uh, it's not there's only one cryptocurrency out there right now, which I think is called Zcash, which is really, really anonymous. But even then, I'm not trying to hide my money from the federal government. That's a fight I don't want to fight. Uh, yeah, you don't want to mess these are that. things that, again, are on the periphery that I don't really worry about because I'm just trying to make I'm just trying to make art and yeah. and trying to figure out ways to get it to, to people who want to consume my art and just figure out how to ways to be a creator. And it's, it's not a, this, this other peripheral stuff I am aware of. However, I try not to let it occupy too much space in my brain. Love it. Love it. Well, let's, let's leave it there. I knew we weren't going to get through. I think, I think we scratched the tip of a very big iceberg. I feel like totally. you know, we're... We're a little, we're a little asteroid that just hit Jupiter, right? <laughs> so there's totally. a lot more, a lot more to learn about this stuff. Um, but as far as Jesse Dipmar goes, if people want to connect with you or look at your work or buy some of your pieces uh, through your sure. open season, what's the, what's the good place for them to start? Start at Instagram. It's my name on Instagram, Jesse Dipmar, and from there you can click on a link to my open sea. The if you if you get onboarded now, you might be able to bid on my Tom Brady by the end of the week. It ends on Friday. So if you start the onboarding process now, you might get there. If you don't start the onboarding process now, you have no fear. There are other things up for sale uh, on my in my NFT space, and there will be more coming as well. I, I plan to every new piece I make that I post to my Instagram also have it be available for purchase with a corresponding print. 
uh, via OpenSea. So uh, if you're, and I got a couple people that I'm excited that I'm gonna be, that I've already photographed that are not uh, published yet, that are coming out very soon that I think that people are gonna be interested in purchasing. So, uh, you know, I would just recommend that people get onboarded, they figure out MetaMask, they figure out OpenSea, they wrap their heads around Ethereum and crypto and the blockchain and smart contracts and they do their best to get all of that into their brain because even though it doesn't look like it right now, this, these are the things that we will be dealing with and, and this is how we will be making work and interfacing with our employers and our fans and our, our, and, our, and our patrons in the future. I love it. I love it. I can tell you last year this time, I never would have considered stringing the words together. Man, I want a Jesse Dittmar NFT in my digital wallet. <laughs> me, me either, Frederick. Me either. This is, this, this is all very new to me too. And it's just very exciting. That's part of why it's exciting. It's so new. Yeah, love it. Well, we'll leave it right there. Uh, Jesse, at Jesse Dittmar on Instagram. If you want to catch up to this guy, definitely check out his work. Give him some feedback. It is, uh, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be inspired and a little intimidated by looking at the breadth and the depth of work that this guy does. So definitely Thank check it out. Thank All you right, very Jesse, much. You have a good rest of your week. Thanks for popping in and doing this for us. Um, and you yeah, too. you and I are you and I are going to talk again on some other events. So I'll, I'll see you over there. So absolutely. Be... All right, man. You have a good one. All Take right. care. Thanks, Frederick. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thanks for coming.